My name is Mark Little. I'm the managing director of the Kena Institute, and we at the Institute are very proud to host you today. The Dean Speaker Series is made possible through the generous support of the Archie K. Davis Endowment and was created to bring outstanding scholars and leaders from the fields of business, education, and government to share thoughts and insights with UNC Kenan Flagler and uh, the university and community at large. Today's speaker is someone I'm particularly honored to introduce. Susan St. Ledger is president of Worldwide Field Operations for Splunk Incorporated. If you aren't familiar with Splunk's work, the company provides software plat a software platform that enables organizations to gain real-time operational intelligence by harnessing the value of their machine data. Its software collects and indexes data at massive scale, regardless of format or source, and enables users to quickly and easily search, correlate, analyze, monitor, and report on this data in real time. And Splunk's machine data is generated by software applications, information technology, infrastructure, electronic devices, and systems. Susan has served in her current role since 2017, having previously served as Splunk's chief revenue officer. During her tenure with the company, she has played an instrumental role in growing the annual revenues from 670 million to projected 1.74 billion for the fiscal year ahead. Uh, before joining Splunk, Susan served as chief revenue officer Marketing Cloud at Salesforce.com, provider of enterprise cloud computing software from 2012 to 2016. She has also served in a variety of senior sales management roles at Salesforce.com and Sun Microsystems. She holds a BS in computer science from the University of Scranton. With that, please join me in welcoming Susan St. Ledger to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's an honor to be here, first of all, so thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, we're going to talk today about a high-growth mindset and, and what I think that means and, and kind of the journey that I've been on throughout my career in a very high-growth environment in this crazy technology, fast-paced world. Um, but first and foremost, being here at UNC, I have to tell you, is a, a great privilege. Um, I look at any institution that provides such incredible education. I believe that education is the greatest gift that you can give anybody. And it is my number one philanthropic platform. It's where I planned on, once I retire, spending a whole lot more time, but it's definitely the platform I focus on today. Second of all, I am a college hoops lover. I am a student of the game, and I am excited to go tonight. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Um, but when I, when I talk about being a student of the game, it really is, I feel like so much of my learning um, I've learned from coaches, either coaches I've actually uh, played for or coaches that I've studied. And, you know, first and foremost, John Wooden is the coach that I've studied uh, the most. But we're here, right? And there's a legend that existed here. And I will say that um, Dean Smith is somebody that I admired. Um, I, being a student of the game, even though I am a Notre Dame fan, sorry, um, even though I'm a Notre Dame fan, I spent a ton of time just watching great programs and obviously North Carolina is amongst the best. And when I think about Dean Smith, he's certainly in that one of the very few that is in that same category as a John Wooden. You don't get to win 77.6% of your games over 36 years without having a high growth mindset, without removing limits and believing in things that are impossible, right? On top of it, Coach Smith was an educator. He wasn't just a coach, he was an educator. He cared deeply about his, his kids on and off the court and what happened to them as they became men. And there are many, so many points out there that show that. The other thing that really jumps out about me and when I think about a high growth mindset, it's about this well-balanced environment and a well-balanced human being. And it's one of the things that I've come to understand about UNC and something that's a big part of my belief system. I see your ands all over the campus. Um, that's a real thing. Don't let anybody tell you it's not, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but this balance of EQ and IQ. Um, but when I think about Dean Smith, it's not just that. It's his also, he took his responsibility socially very seriously as, as well. And most of you probably are well aware of the work that he did for desegregation. And you know, to me, that's all part of a high growth mindset. He's not just a coach, he's an educator. 
and he takes his responsibility uh, seriously in terms of the impact he can have socially. And so if you think, if you've heard many stories from players that have worked, or sorry, that played for him or somebody like a Coach Wooden, it's a lifetime impact, right? And hopefully all of you will have opportunities throughout your career or maybe even here through some of the teachers that have made a lifetime impact on you already. And so throughout my talk, as I tell you about my high growth journey, I'm going to try and share some of the key takeaways and lessons. And I can tell you that the number one lesson is that who you learn from is vital to your success. Who you learn from at every point in your life is vital to your success. And that's where I feel like I got an incredible start in life and that the first two people I learned from were my amazing parents, um, Mary, who was a registered nurse, and Dave, um, a teacher, history teacher, both in high school and college. I grew up as a tomboy in small town America, incredibly competitive, both in basketball, softball, and golf. And I was very much focused on math and science. But my, my mom and dad taught me lessons that I didn't, it was a reflection years later that made me realize what they had done for me. And my mom taught me to be a student of life, which is learn from your experiences. It's not just about the classroom. You can be anything you want to be and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And that comes from somebody who wanted to be a doctor but was told in her area she had to be a nurse. So that was my mom. Be a, and it was clearly for me that it was be a student of life. My dad, on the other hand, being the teacher, taught me to be a student for life. And I really distinctively remember the first day that it came across to me, I was a freshman in high school, and I was, as I said, this type A, kind of stressed out, competitive kid, had to get A's in everything. Only loved math and science, but I still had to get A's in everything, and I hated studying the other stuff, including history, which he was a history teacher. And one day he sat down with me and he said, you're just completely missing the point. First of all, education is the greatest gift you can ever have. Second of all, it's not about the A's and it's not about the tests. The whole purpose of school is so you can learn how to learn so that you can be successful for the rest of your life. All you're doing in school is to learn how to learn to set you up to be successful for the rest of your life. And the way you learn math and the way you learn science and the way you learn languages and the way you learn history stretches your mind in all different ways so that you'll be able to learn new things for the rest of your life. Ironic, given that I ended up probably in the fastest changing industry that exists. Um, great, great, great tip, Dad. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so if you look at my career, so I think the two things combined from my parents, my mom was kind of the risk taker, right? Be anything you want to be, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. My dad on the learning side gave me incredible intellectual curiosity. And if I really think about my career, my career is not a ladder, it is a jungle gym. You'll talk about all the different what I call pivots that I made. I've done many, many different things in my career. I didn't have some plan that said someday I'm going to run all of the customer facing functions at a tech company. That, that just wasn't. But what I did was I looked at the opportunity to learn every time. And when I saw things that were intriguing to me, I would take the risk and I would go do those things. And I call those things pivots. And ironically, my first pivot was the scariest pivot I ever made. And that was the pivot that I made when I was sitting in your seats. Um, probably a little bit earlier, it was my freshman year of, of college. If you grow up as a math science person in small town America, you are told to be a doctor. Because the, the thought of engineering back when I graduated, like there was no big talk about engineering, STEM program, not a, non-existent. And so I majored in biology and eventually took a computer science course and went, huh, I'd rather do this. So that was my biggest pivot, and it scared the hell out of me because I didn't actually know what I would do with it, but I knew I was really intrigued by it, and I loved the computer science class. So pivot number one, incredibly scary. Back in a time where very few women were in computer science, we, I graduated, I think, one of three women that graduated in computer science at the time that I did from, from my school. 
So it was the beginning of kind of all this great fortune. And I was talking um, to Gary, who runs SILS. Uh, I don't know if Gary's here. Um, we, we were talking earlier, and I said, I'm, I've been very lucky. And he said, well, it's not just luck. And I said, well, to me, luck is where opportunity meets preparedness. And like take, making that leap and taking that computer science risk to move to computer science led me to this. And who knew, right? <laughs> so sorry, this is my <laughs> bad habit. I got in late last night. OK, so it's the beginning of this really fortunate high growth journey. And I think about it as you know, really thinking through, striving how to do things that you're not really sure were possible. So the first real introduction to high growth was when I went to work for a company called Sun Microsystems. And some of you are nodding your heads because you, you know Sun. It was, it was an incredible company um, until it wasn't. But luckily, I was gone long before then. Luckily, I was gone long before then. We'll, we'll talk more about that later when we talk about disrupting yourselves when you're on top. So um, Sun was, I was there when it was a little over a billion, and it went to 22 billion in the 12 years I was there. It was an incredible ride. Um, it was full of pivots for me. I started as a pre-sales engineer. I, um, I got to uh, be a Java architect. I got this incredible opportunity to be the chief of staff at one point um, for the president and CEO, which taught me how the entire business was run. It was, and then eventually went into sales. Like it was just full of pivots. And so literally from the first day that I got there where I was a junior systems engineer, and to tell you how junior, there's six levels and I was a two, because I'd come out of the government. NSA was actually my first hardcore computer scientist at NSA. So I went from level two systems engineer to 10 years later running a $3.2 billion sales organization. Now, the reason I tell you that is not to say, oh, look at me. The reason I tell you that is because when you think about high growth companies, they afford you accelerated opportunity that traditional companies don't. And the reason for that is they have to hire so many people, they can't possibly hire everybody from the outside. And so what they do is they have to place their bets on the high potential people, which means that you get put in jobs you're probably not quite totally ready for, but they're gonna take a chance on you and you're gonna grow into those jobs. And so lesson number two is that high growth, a high growth environment definitely lends itself to accelerated opportunity. So after about 12 years at Sun, I looked around, was bored, didn't, there was no other job I wanted at that company. And so it was time for another pivot, <laughs> needed to grow. And that led me to a company called Salesforce, which everybody sits here shaking their head now, but in 2004, nobody knew that. <laughs> um, and so this was probably one of the most major pivots I ever made. But the interesting thing is, if you go pivot, my first pivot was computer science, changing to computer science. My second pivot was leaving NSA to go to Sun. My third pivot was this one. And even though it was probably one of the most dramatic, what started becoming really obvious to me was the pivot thing starts to get easier. Because you've already proven to yourself that you can do it. And so now it's part of your belief system. So I was at Salesforce. Um, but when I first went there, everybody told me I was crazy. Do you know why? This cloud computing thing will never, ever happen in the enterprise. Okay. So we all know how that ended. Um, but the net of it is, what, what was intriguing to me was having a, a, a focus on software and seeing that companies were spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars on things like Siebel and never getting them implemented. That was my experience at Sun. $120 million, and we never got to use it, right? Then you looked at the consumer cloud, right? You looked at the Yahoo's of the world, and they seem to have this really unique ability to make changes every day, and yet my personal Yahoo, my Yahoo that's customized for me, never broke. So there's something to this cloud computing thing. And so I take the leap, and as much as I would love to say I knew Salesforce was gonna be what it was gonna be, I didn't. But here's what I did believe. I believed that this cloud computing thing had to happen. And so I didn't know if Salesforce would really be the one to get it right. But I did know that I needed to be early in 
on something that I believed was the next big market creation. And so that's why I took that risk. And in doing so, I ran into Mark Benioff. I don't know how many of you know Mark's persona, but he is a brilliant, brilliant businessman. As I say, I wouldn't trade him for anything in the world, but God knows there were days I wanted to. <laughs> he is a very, very demanding man. But you want to work for demanding people. We'll talk more about that later. So if I have to net out what Mark taught me, there were many things. But he really took my mindset to another level. He shifted my mindset from some, I thought I was big thinking, and then he actually showed me what it was like to be big thinking. And the greatest gift of all was, I saw him do it over and over with me and with other colleagues. And not everybody made it, right? Because not everybody has the capability to make that leap. But what I, what I learned from him was not only that my mindset could be bigger and that I need to continually challenge myself, but he showed me how to shift other people's mindsets. And quite frankly, that's a big part of what I brought to Splunk, is showing people just how much faster we could grow than they were growing, showing people what a high growth at scale looked like, and putting some of those things in place. And you know, just as an example, at, at Salesforce, when I got there, the average selling price was 67K. And eight years later, the last two deals in the year that we did were $80 million, $123 million that were done by my team, right? And that, but that was Mark the whole time making us realize and making us believe how big things could be. It's that mindset shift. And so at Salesforce, again, a bunch of different pivots. I, I ran customer success, which is the post sales. I ran platform sales. I ran uh, marketing cloud. I ran... Um, a bunch of different things, strategic sales. So, so lots of different pivots. So now if I start to marry all my experience, it's who I learned from, right? It was amazing that I got to learn from the president and CEO at Sun, and now I've learned even more from Mark Benioff. So the who you learn from thing keeps showing up. The pivots get easier, keep showing up. And then the thing that I really lear learned at, at Salesforce that hadn't struck me at that point in my career was market opportunity. Being able to recognize market opportunity. And I was talking to um, some of the people from your computer science uh, program earlier today and we were talking about how they're actually teaching a course now on product market fit. So important. You have no idea how many products get created that are really cool, but there's actually nobody to buy them. Or there might be 10 people that buy them. But understanding market opportunity as you all think about the job you want to go to, the first thing I encourage you to look at is how big is that market opportunity? And then is the company you're looking at have a shot at being number one or two? Maybe three. If the market's big enough, you might have three players. But it, look at market opportunity. Understand how big that market can be. And ask them how they think about their market opportunity. Because if they can't articulate it, they probably don't understand it. So, so now I'm in this mindset. I've been at Salesforce 11 and a half years. Probably time for a pivot. Um, and, and now what's top of mind for me is market opportunity. Enter Splunk. The driver for Splunk and the op market opportunity at Splunk is data. Okay? It's data. We are in a digital world that is exploding. It's all about digitization. Digital transformation everywhere. This is the biggest market opportunity I've ever seen, and I just felt like I had to be part of it. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't know that at first. They called me twice, and I'm like, your logs, your IT logs, so not interesting to me. <laughs> and then they got me to meet with the CEO for two hours, and then I went, ah, holy. Yeah, this is, this is really interesting. Did a lot of due diligence, figured out what they were, and decided to join. And then he said, you told me in our interview you have a marketing problem. You now own marketing. <laughs> so we're working on it. Um, but it's really interesting. Data is everywhere. There's a Harvard Business Study that says that companies that make decisions based upon data truly are data-driven have 5% productivity benefits and 6% profitability. And while that may sound small in big companies, that's a lot. 
you can move that needle for Wall Street five, five points, six points, they're gonna, they're gonna take notice. And it astounds me every day what companies as well as universities are doing with Splunk, right? It's everything from traditional security and IT use cases, which people broadly know about. You guys are doing an awesome job here um, on security use cases. We had a meeting this morning, we went through everything. Um, but it's, it's unbelievable how, you know, so at UNLV, this is a very interesting story, they actually have predictive models for student success and can tell you about looking at the predictive models, which students are in trouble, and then they have course correction. Well, guess what? That professor who created all that just came here to UNC and we met with him this morning. <laughs> so, uh, uh, oh, sitting right there. <laughs> Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> later. Okay. Introduce yourself later. But it's, it's astounding, right? You don't think about that when you think about IT logs, right? But it's such a powerful data platform. We have Domino's Pizza. I know their, their CEO was in here talking to you guys. They use it for their whole e-commerce, right, to, to actually um, figure out what's working from a, a campaigns and coupons and and what they want to do from an e-commerce perspective. And then we have things like the Global Emancipation Network, right? This incredible nonprofit organization that is part of our Splunk for Good um, program that is actually using it to help stop human trafficking, to tie together law enforcement and other government agencies and other nonprofits that are stopping human trafficking. I mean, it's really incredibly powerful. That's why this market opportunity is so big because there is no job that any one of you will go out there and get that will not require data for you to be successful in your job. But not everything's easy. We're not a data-driven species. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really fascinating to look at, at the uh, statistics, but we just did a thought leadership piece where we talked to a, a num quite, a, quite a broad set of customers, and they believe that 55% of the data they don't even know they have, or if they do know they have it, they don't know what to do with it, right? So it's this whole data wrangling problem, which is what you see from IDC. IDC talks about 80% of the time is spent wrangling and 20% of the time actually accessing data. So we have some work to do, but when I talk about the market opportunity, here's my provocative statement because I'm taught to think big. We will be part of every data-driven decision in the enterprise. So, um, as I think about the journey, so much of, you know, again, it's luck is where opportunity is preparedness. I worked hard, I was prepared, I studied, but a lot of luck, right? The who you learned from, the guesses you took in the early days about the jobs you took. Um, but you do develop insights, even if they're hindsight, <laughs> I guess hindsight versus insight. And in my case, they've led to a number of what I would call leadership principles for high growth. So number one, always be learning. This is the, the key I got from my dad, just you're learning how to learn, and you've always got to be learning. Um, I think aside from the fact that it'd be really boring not to, if you want to be competitive, I don't care what field you're in, you always have to be learning. The, the world of technology is changing every other industry. So it doesn't matter if you're in tech. It's changing every other industry. So when you show up, for those of you who are in the room and going out on job interviews, make it clear to people that you are a learner. Make it clear to them that you're intellectually curious, that you have a high intellectual capacity. And I'll give you an example. What I, I, there's never an interview that I interview somebody that I don't tell me, ask them, what's the last major pivot you made? What did you need to learn and how did you go about learning it? Right? And it's amazing how many people cannot answer that question. Right? And then the other piece of advice I would give you is when you're going out, as we've talked about in some of the meetings today, you're in the driver's seat, right? Talent is, is sparse right now, right? There are more jobs out there and more opportunities out there for people like you, really well-educated people. So you better be interviewing that company. Interview them about their market opportunity. Do they really understand it? Do they know how they're gonna get there? Interview them about the growth opportunity you will have at their company. And make them give you examples. Make them give you real-life examples 
of accelerated growth that's happened at their company and of the experiences that they've offered people. Number two is continuous improvement. So when I was at Salesforce, um, in the entire 11 and a half years I was there, we crushed it every quarter. We never missed. At the end of every quarter, we celebrated. We celebrated big, as you do in Silicon Valley and high tech. You celebrate big every quarter. But then, the very next week, we would be in Mark Benioff's management meetings. And if that was the only lens you had into our company, you would swear that we were the worst performing company on the face of the earth. <laughs> like, because that's what those meetings were for. Those meetings, celebration was done. We were now into the next quarter, and what we needed to focus on is everything we needed to do differently, everything that we needed to do better. Hindsight is 2020. Why don't people use it? You always have it at your fingertips. Why don't you use it? Why don't you say, that was great, or that was pretty good, or that was good enough, but here's how I could make it better. And it's that mindset of continuous improvement. That would, that's what great companies do, and quite frankly, that's what great individuals do. They're never satisfied, and they just keep on going. And then lastly, you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. If you go through an extended period that you're not uncomfortable, I would challenge you that you're not growing. If you're uncomfortable, it means you're growing. I have a little video I want to play for you, which uh, I think is, is very telling. And it's um, the setup, the quick setup is that it is um, a girl who is 10 years old, but she's already training at the Olympic uh, ski jump. And so let's take a look. She's got a GoPro on her helmet, okay? So that's, that's the lens you've got is her GoPro, her talking to her coach about to try something new. I'll be fine. Have fun. I'll do it. Well. Here goes something, I guess. Okay. You can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow flows. Just keep it straight and you'll be fine. Do okay. Do you do on the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much? Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. A bigger 20. Go ahead. You got this. I got it. <laughs> It's fine. You'll, you'll be fine. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. Suspense at the top with the first time freaks you yeah. out. That's the only thing. It's so fun. Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! So, what do we see? <laughs> she was uncomfortable. It was the next phase of her training and growth. And then you started to see her mindset shift as the coach is talking to her. It's just a bigger 20. She's trying to talk herself into it. But then at the end, 60 seems like nothing now, right? And so it really is, it's now in her belief system. That was nothing. Now she's moved on. That's in her belief system, and now she's ready to do the next thing. And my, I really, my belief is that your belief system is built based upon your experiences. And so it's a matter of continue challenging yourself, and that's why 
as I talk about every pivot got a little bit easier, it's because it just became part of my belief system. This is a Bill Gates quote um, that, uh, believe it or not, oops, sorry, we used to use a lot at Salesforce, amazing, because we used to have a, a fierce competition with them. <laughs> um, but it, we often used it. And again, this is something that became a huge part of my belief system, whether it's the sun experience of what happened to me in 10 years, going from a junior SE to a VP of $3.2 billion business, or whether it was the average selling price of what we saw at Salesforce, you know, 67K to 123 million, not as the average, but as the big deals. Like it just, it starts to become part of your belief system. But you always overestimate what you can do in one, and you always underestimate what you can do in 10. So, high growth is fun, so much opportunity, but it's hard. So what makes it hard? What makes it hard? Other than maybe if you didn't get the right market opportunity. If you didn't get the mar right market opportunity, the high growth opportunity is never gonna be there. But assuming you have the right market, here are some of the things, in my opinion, that are the hardest. Number one is centered around transformation when you're at the top. We'll talk about that in a minute. Number two is talent. And if I had them in priority order, I would put talent first. <laughs> um, and number three is alignment. So this is uh, just a, a specific to the tech landscape, but it just goes to show you how hard high growth is. And it's old data, but, but it hasn't gotten, any, it hasn't gotten material, materially different. In 1980, the number of companies, software companies, that to that date had, from 1980 to 2013, the number that went public were 30, almost 3,200, 31,097. The number that made it to a billion were 108. Okay, that's 3%. So for everybody who thinks startups are easy, <laughs> just, just understand that. And then you look at how many made it to 4 billion, 19, okay? And so that now is one half of 1%. And so it could be that, again, like we said, it could be that the market opportunity is, isn't there. Or it could be that they got disrupted by a competitor somewhere along the way because somebody went and said, wow, what they're doing is a really cool idea. Let's do it differently or better. You can kind of think of it as getting Ubered, right? I mean, it's a verb now, right? Everybody knows what we, when we talk about getting Ubered, everybody knows what we mean. And that's what happens if you don't continually disrupt yourself or think about new ways to do things. If you stay incredibly comfortable when you're on top, and this doesn't, this is whether you're an individual and you're staying comfortable, you're staying stagnant because you're on top, or whether you become a company, studies show that only 25% of companies have the courage or the foresight to disrupt themselves when they're on top. Why not do it when you're on top? Because that's when you create the breakaway companies. That's when you create the breakaway companies. Talent. I have to be careful here not to go too long on this one because this is my favorite subject. I tell my team that my only talent is knowing what talent looks like. And so far it's worked out pretty well. And it, it's really true that you could, even if you have the greatest ideas as a, as a leader, you can't scale by yourself. If you don't hire the best possible talent that's out there, you will fail. And so a couple of things that I think about um, when I think about talent. Number one is interview for a high growth mindset. So interview for learning, the things we talked about. Interview for the pivots. Make them demonstrate it. Make sure that they, that you interview them to see if they're resilient, to see if they thrive in uncertainty. That's a growth mindset. The second thing is to create a feedback of culture, or a culture of feedback, sorry. So I don't know why it is, but I have met so many leaders, so many really otherwise strong leaders that cannot give feedback. So there's a couple of things I'll say about feedback. First of all, as you sit in this room, think about the best teacher that you've had here at UNC. Think about the best coach you ever played for, and for those of you who have worked, think about the best manager you've ever worked for. They're not the ones who told you you were perfect. They're not the ones who said that everything you did was exactly the way it should be. They're the ones who stretched you. The ones who made you uncomfortable. Those are the best teachers. Those are the best coaches. Those are the best managers. 
All I have to say is licking the sugar off shit is a waste of time. It's just a waste of time. It's still bad underneath. Just give it to them direct and make them grow. Understand that human nature is such that our own growth will stall if we're the only ones trying to make ourselves grow. That's why mentorship's important. That's why who you work for is important. Who you learn from is important. Because human nature, by definition, cannot stretch yourself to those limits. You need somebody else to help you continually move that bar. So be direct, be constructive, and understand that for those who may be managers at some point down the road, if you only give the feedback to the ones who are really um, failing, you're doing a disservice to your top people because your top people are the ones who need to be stretched and grown. The other thing in the talent bucket that is incredibly important is diversity and inclusion. I think probably the best news about this topic when you say it today is that nobody, most people, not nobody, most people understand now that it is a business imperative because it really impacts business. It's no longer just a checkbox. It's no longer just something you should do. Studies show di diverse teams outperform homogenous teams by 15%. Ethnically diverse teams, so that's gender, gender diverse, ethnically diverse by 33%. And 85% of CEOs are very clear on the fact that the DNI strategy impacts their bottom line. Couldn't agree more. And I'm really, really proud to work for a company that has um, a very strong DNI program. Um, we, we have a great CHRO, Chief HR Officer, um, who's been there. She's been there a little bit longer than me, so probably about three years. And um, about a year and a half ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, we started to publish our DNI numbers. And um, they weren't pretty, right? But if you don't publish them and you don't hold yourself accountable and you don't tell people what you're going to do to move the needle, you won't focus on it. And so the good news is we've made significant improvement. We started with gender diversity. There's a lot of cascading things we did to make it work, but the net of it is we've moved um, at, our, at our size, which we're 4,400 employees, we've moved the needle by 2%. And so that's a pretty material movement. We're gonna keep going, right? There's so much more that we need to do. But we do things like we um, make sure that job descriptions are not gender bias. It's like there's actually a real science now around job descriptions and job descriptions attack, attracting certain genders. Um, we obviously cast a very wide net when it comes to both D&I for all the particular jobs, and you show that if you put multiple candidates other, um, on, a, on a palette, if you will, of candidates, um, and you have more than two of them be outside of this, this stereotype, in our case, call it engineering, you know, white male, um, you're, you're much more likely to hire diverse candidates. So, and we have lots of obviously high potential programs and things like that that we invest in, but I'm very proud to be part of a company that's doing this. When you go look for a job, go look for a company that cares about this because in the end it will be a better performing company and it will be a better culture. And my plea to all of the men in the room is that don't think that this is a, a problem that needs to be solved by females. We, can't, we cannot move the needle without having the men help. And then everybody needs to help on the underserved minorities, underrepresented minorities, I should say. The other thing I'll say on this one, and I don't have the answer, <laughs> but the other thing I'll say on this one is, um, you know, even though there are lots of companies now where we are in Silicon Valley focusing on this and spending time on this, the problem really starts in grade school. And so whatever all of us can do in our own communities to help try and solve that problem in grade school and middle school, all we're doing is creating a few companies or even, you know, more than a few companies where this is important, but all we're doing is stealing from each other, right? We need to actually go and, and fix the root cause, which is that STEM is not widely available to everybody. So, um, Talent, if you're, if you're a leader, if you're a manager, get this right. This is the number one thing you have to get right. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't get the talent right, you're going to lose. Or going to fail, I should say. The last thing is alignment. 
Whenever you're trying to change something and, and, and do something quickly, grow something or change something, whether this is a company or whether this is some initiative that you're trying to do within um, your curriculums here as teachers, whether it's, you know, we, we, we had a lot of discussion today about creating, you know, how do we create better joint programs between corporations and the school. Um, whatever it is that you're trying to move the needle on that is, you know, unconventional, there are two things that are really important in order to, to really make it work. Number one is you have to explain the why. You have to explain the why. Why is it we're trying to do what we're trying to do? Because fundamentally, if you don't get people to buy into the why, they're just following you because they have to, right? And if they, they're, if they're not in it, they're not involved in the mission, it doesn't work. The second aspect is you need to be repetitious. Because if you were one of the people who created the why, you've probably been working on it for months, maybe even years. And then you announce it and expect everybody to come along. It takes time. You have to be repetitious. And in cases like ours where we have layers of management, you've got to make sure that you cascade it through and through and bring people along with you, the why, the why, the why, to make, people, to make sure people are genuine, genuinely on board. But my challenge to those of you who maybe aren't creating those initiatives and will be part of the people we're trying to bring along when you first get out into the workforce is if they don't, if somebody doesn't tell you the why, don't just follow. It's a two-way street. Ask the why. Because if you ask the why, you may find holes in the why. And I, that's the type of environment that we're creating, that we at least try and creating, is a two-way street. We want the feedback. We want the feedback. So make sure that when you go out there, you realize that as an individual contributor, your voice is so important to the workforce. And providing you pick the right company, they want to hear your voice. So change is the only constant in a high growth or a fast paced initiative. And so alignment through clear communication is important. So these are the three inhibitors. I think we've covered them all pretty much. Um, ironically, I talk about the why. It's one of John Wooden's um, big quotes, which is, if the team understood the why, they could endure any what. This is one of my favorite all-time John Wooden quotes, which is, ability may get you to the top, but it takes character to keep you there. And in the world that I live in, what that means to me, other than what it means in my everyday life as a president and a having the responsibility of a president role in a tech company, my employees have to want to work for us. And our customers have to want to work, have to work, want to work with us and buy from us. And it stems from trust, which of course stems from character. And with that, I thank you, and I'll open it up to questions. Hey, everyone. We're recording this, so um, if you could just wait for the microphone for your question, but I know we have one to kick things off. So, How do you see Splunk growing within the next two to three years? So, <clears throat> so how do I see Splunk growing within the next two to three years? Um, so the I interesting thing about Splunk, as I said, it's in the data world, as you know, you're very familiar with it. Um, there are a number of things that we're doing, but the big picture is that we're doing, a, we have a lot of innovation coming that takes away a huge part of the data wrangling problem and allows you to act on the data wherever it lives. So that's huge in a distributed environment. There's a ton of, uh, there's a ton of technology coming to help with that. The second thing is to help you orchestrate and automate things. So um, today you can get lots of great outcomes and insights and you can do some levels of, of automation, but we're taking automation and orchestration to a whole other level so that you can actually scale all the actions that come from those insights. And then lastly, we're putting the power of Splunk in the hands of more users, meaning in making sure that we create applications within Splunk for which you don't need to be a Splunk ninja We'll still have the, all the ninja power for those of you who want that, never taking that away. But um, things like Splunk, Splunk Business Flow, which we just put out a beta, where you can 
literally ingest your data and actually see your business flows and figure out where things are not flowing the right way from a process perspective. Or giving you mobile capabilities that allow um, users um, who are, again, less technical to get uh, alerts and take actions based upon the orchestrations that you set up. Um, or augmented reality, which I'm sure there's some place here in, in the corner of UNC that this would, would, this would matter. Actually, we're doing it at the University of Connecticut in the hydroponics lab where everything is censored and the people who work there are not, um, they are not technicians. And so they go around with their mobile device and they get the readings off of all their sensors. So it's a huge effort to cross the chasm and unleash the power of Splunk to more users um, and many more business use cases. Does that answer your question? Great. Anyone else want to ask a question? So it's the overall population that exists, um, especially at the more senior levels. So that's a, a big part of what we're focused on. And so there's, you know, obviously, as I said, we're, we're going to, we are focused on making our company one of the places where people, you know, who are DNI want to come. Um, but at the same time, we have internal programs that are really focused on growing our, our top DNI talent as well. But it, it's more of a, that's why I said you have to go back to grade school to really solve the problem. I'm just curious how you're balancing. They can be at odds. It's interesting that you say that. Um, probably the best example most recently was um, we, we did a, um, we brought in a new chief technology officer who runs all products and engineering for us. And um, he's truly, all this innovation that I was just talking about came from him and his team. And he's brought in over 275 new architects and engineers that were born in the cloud in the big data world. Um, his name is Tim Tully and he actually wrote MapReduce um, he spent his whole time working on big data in the cloud at Yahoo and understands that world of Hadoop and he wants to create a coexistent world, right? Not Splunk versus, it's a, it's a coexistent world. Um, but he had, a, he had this, you know, just so many people to go hire. And we wanted to, you know, double down on the investment, really go. So he had 275 people that he was trying to hire and literally they completely slowed things down to ensure that every doc at every single position had no less than two women and, and um, the gender diversity was the target for him because that's where they were waning. They were fine on other aspects of um, diversity. And so until they had two women interviewed for every single job, they didn't allow any hiring to be done. And he massively increased the percentage of women in the engineering organization. So that's an example. But it, to your point, you can say it or you can actually make the effort, right? And it's really hard to make the effort, but you have to. You mentioned that you have a knack for identifying talent. I'm wondering at what point in your career you realized that and if you've done anything to hone that skill. Mm, that's a great question. Um, so I will tell you that I, I believe it was something that I had very early on. And I'll tell you where I think it came from. So when I was a, a what they called a systems engineer, which is a pre-sales engineer helping the salespeople at Sun, um, there was a team of eight of us. Um, and there were four of us that, they, that all the salespeople came to. And so we were completely overworked. <laughs> And we were, you know, just nonstop, you know, demos late at night and you know, just crazy stuff. And the other four were like living this cushy life. And I was like, what the hell? Like, it was so frustrating to me. And so it was one of those things that, um, ironically, after a couple of years, the, the, my like, boss's boss's boss tapped me and he said, we really, you know, want you to get into management. And I said, well, why would I do that? I said, you know, they, they lose their technical ability. They like run the loaner pool and they let all these, like really weak people stay like what what's going on like why would I do that and he was like so what would you do and so I sat there and said I would do this I would do this I would do this and he's like then why don't you just go do it and so I took that job and um, quite frankly was committed that I was just going to hire nothing but like really top talent at least in my lens and I, I created this incredible team and then from there it just became a self-fulfilling prophecy that I was never like willing to stray away from um, now, that's not to say, look, when you've hired thousands of people, you're going to make mistakes. Um, and so then you obviously learn from your mistakes. But if you make a mistake, the big thing is fix it quickly. 
right? If you, once you know you've made a mistake, there's no more, well, I better give them six more months. If you know you've made a mistake, um, I, I have, sometimes I get a little bit provocative with people when they won't, like, there's a couple of things. Number one is um, you can't teach smart at this age. Like it's done. Like by the time they show up to work, I can, if they don't have the if they don't have the capacity, I can't teach that. Right? I can teach them new skills and new competencies, but fundamentally, there are just some people that don't have the capacity to do the jobs we're asking them to do. And so, like you just have to make those calls. And so that's that's one aspect. Um, the how how I've honed it is some of the stuff I talked about here. I, you know, in the early days, I never would have thought about interviewing for a high growth mindset. I never would have thought about, you know, just digging into people's learning and how they learn. Um, so that, that's been a huge aspect. I never would have thought about the resilient aspect. But where, where I think I really learned that one was at Salesforce. It was really interesting in that um, in the early days when we were selling Salesforce automation, like tons of reps were successful, right? Well, you use the product every day. If you can't sell what you use every day, good luck, right? Well, then once we got to the next product and the next product and the next product that required a much greater intellectual capacity because they, they, you weren't selling the stuff you were using every day, well, now you start to see all these people drop off. Like that literally were thought to be stars and now all of a sudden they're not successful, they're not successful, they're not successful. And so that's when it, like, I started to realize like, if you interview for the job that's today or in, you're in a high growth company, how do you make sure those people are going to be the same people that can be successful in, in the same company when it changes so dramatically over the next three years or five years? And so those are probably the things that I, that I honed um, the, the most over time. Does that answer your question? I think we have time for one more. I see your hand up. My name is Matt Bernacki. I'm in the School of Education, and I came from UNLV. Uh, and what we did there and do here is build programs to try and help students learn how to learn from a learning sciences perspective. I'm curious about how that translates to the business world when it gets to be more ill-structured. So here we're teaching how to learn in higher ed. When you talk about pivots, learning how to recognize a pivot, learning how to apply skills, analytical reasoning and transfer, all these things are buzzing in my head. What does that look like in a business context? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. In fact, when you were talking this morning, and I was familiar with Matt's story, in fact, um, I tell the story often, and he was sitting in the room today, and I didn't realize it was him because we had never met. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, what I would say is it, it's a lot harder because we don't have those, those structured learning, if you will, as much. Um, it's ironic in that one of the big things that I've been focused on is because of the complexity of Splunk, I'm super focused on the enablement. So think about that as, and what we're starting to talk about it as a curriculum, if you will. Um, in the past, it was um, basically you do webinars and you teach everybody about everything, right? But that's not really an effective way. And so we're building just-in-time learning modules to help people because sometimes you're talking to a CISO, sometimes it's a CIO, sometimes it's a business user. Sometimes it's a university, sometimes it's, you know. And so we're just starting to get to the point where we're trying to measure that. Um, but in terms of, of people recognizing their own pivots, I think it's about talking them through it. One of the exercises that I like to do for people when I talk about my career being a jungle gym, people often come to me and say, well, how do I get to be you? Or how do I get to be Doug or CEO? Or how do I get to be, you know, whatever, the CIO? Um, and so, one of the things that I do is it, um, I call it resume momentum, and it's about being able to plot your resume and say, okay, if I look at my resume today, what buckets do I fill? I just pick the word buckets. You guys can, you know, whatever categories, whatever. But if I think about buckets, you know, it's, it's everything from span of control. So in my world, span of control means both people and revenue, right? I think about functions. So how many different functions have you done? Have you done marketing? Have you done sales? Have you done engineering? Have you done services? Like those sorts of things when you want to get to be a broader level executive. Do you actually understand the dials of a business? Have you run a P&L? Right? Do you have international experience? And so the, the best um, way that I teach people about pivots is to say map out your resume and think about the job you may want someday and what are the other buckets that you need to fill. And it doesn't always need to be in any particular order. And I think that's the problem people make is they always want the next, the bigger job with the bigger title with the more money. And it's a natural thing, but if you don't do a couple of laterals to round out your resume, you could be selling yourself short. It doesn't always work that way. But um, 
that's the way I, I like to do a mapping exercise of what, what's really clear from a skills and competencies perspective that, you, that show up on your resume and that you could articulate in a, in a job interview. Does that make sense? In a company. Yeah, and a lot of that, that's why I was trying to distinguish, and maybe not as kind of cost as clear. I mean, I spent 12, you know, seven years at NSA, almost seven years at NSA, 12 years at Sun, and 11 and a half at Salesforce. So I'm not somebody who job hops, right? But most of those pivots were within those companies. And so um, the, probably the best example, the way it worked at, at Salesforce was that um, our CEO had this thing he called intrapreneurs, and it were the people that he fundamentally felt had the intellectual curiosity and capacity and maybe otherwise would be bored. <laughs> and so he would, he would tap those people to try and go do the new things that he needed somebody to go try, um, fulfilling two things, keeping them in the company and having somebody he trusts you know, be, be the, uh, the person who's going to launch the new thing. Um, so that, that's one example. But I, I think um, the biggest thing I would say is uh, you know, once you get in a company, make sure that you do your best to try and understand multiple functions and what they all do and how it all comes together. And depending upon the size of the company, sometimes that's easy to do and sometimes it's really hard to do. Um, but just, you know, really trying to understand the different functions and, and what their design principles are and what their objectives are and what their goals are and how those all come together for the company. That's why the alignment thing is so important. If you don't have you know, we try really hard, and the bigger the company gets, the harder it is, but we try really and har hard to make sure that every single employee knows how their job relates to the true north of the company. And we have our true north, we call it P&I's, priorities and initiatives. At Salesforce, we called it um, V2 Mom, which was business values, methods, obstacles, and metrics. But then it's a cascading event down to every employee. And so one of the, it helped for two reasons, number one, it made everybody understand where they fit in the company, but it also kind of exposed everybody to what the priorities of the company were. And it may intrigue you to say, huh, that sounds really interesting. I want to go work on that priority, which means I may need to be somewhere different. Does that help? I think we're out of time, but um, on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for coming to UNC and you sharing your me. time and expertise with us. And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.